This one blew me away. Greetings, I'm Shad, and I'm here at Castle Koch. It's spelt C-O-C-H, and so you would think it's pronounced Koch, but I've heard people, I think Koch, or even just Koch, is closer in pronunciation. It actually means red, and so this has also been known as the Red Castle because the stone that is being used to build it has a red hue, and when you're looking at it, you can see a little bit of a red hue here and there on the... Uh, on the stones of the castle. But what we're going to be focusing on in this video is the exterior of Castle Cop because there are so many things to comment on. And then in another video, we're gonna be looking at the interior. The exterior of the castle is actually far more historically accurate than the interior. And there are beautiful things to just appreciate. And we're gonna be taking a close look at those. But what's really fascinating about this castle, and it really jumps out at you when you're here in person, is how imposing and grand it looks. And this is in pretty close to pristine condition. And so, in a lot of the castles, of course, they they are in some level of disrepair. This thing, look at it. It is stunning. Not only that, I love its asymmetrical design, okay? It feels a bit more naturally flowing, where it was uh, designed for utility and so ah, we'll put a tower here we'll have a bit of a gatehouse and and there are things to really really love about the external design of this castle and the external design is mostly authentic because this is actually a reconstruction it was reconstructed in the 19th century uh, because the original well, it had several stages there was uh, an older Welsh kind of fortification here and it was rebuilt in the 13th century or 1300s I need to look that up and then it also got destroyed and fell into a big state of disrepair. And then in the, um, uh, the 19th century, it was rebuilt as a bit of a passion project. Now, the reconstruction did endeavor to try and make it as accurate as possible. And from the outside, they did a pretty darn good job with one or two errors uh, here and there. Uh, one of the things that people pointed out that's a bit of an error, they feel, is uh, the type of turrets on the castle. So a turret is like a, a, a mini tower, and it's usually, a, you know, only a couple of meters in diameter. And or, or it sticks out, so it's not in a perfect circle, it's like a half circle and then it has a stretching rectangle thing that connects back to the castle, or so the tower it's adjoining. And so they have very pointed kind of roofs on the turrets here, which is very much a neo-gothic style, not, not classic medieval gothic, uh, but they do look really, really good. And this neo-gothic kind of interpretation of turrets like this come from actual historical turrets that were on medieval castles. And so if you have a look at, say, Carnarvon Castle, you will see turrets on that, which are tiny, like mini towers sticking up from the main towers. And they were there mainly for a lookout position, uh, to get a bit more height, perhaps in defense. But so turrets very much were a thing. And more fantasy style turrets are on Castle Koch right here. So most likely the historical version didn't have them. But everything else is pretty darn close, except for maybe some of the window placements and the size of the windows. It is it is an absolutely beautiful castle. Here's a really interesting detail that we can see from the outside. It's actually just above the gatehouse. Do you see how there is like a break just underneath the hoarding where it stepped out that tiny little bit? All right. Well, that is kind of like a nod to the classic machicolation, you know, um, aesthetic where you had an extended, you know, battlement or something sitting on corbels on the outside. Well, this design here is basically trying to match the aesthetic, but not going so far to the point where you need actual machicolations. And it's not the only castle that does this. We actually see that very design feature on historical castles. So this wasn't a kind of 19th century aesthetic that they added because it's common, you do see that style on neo-Gothic castles. No, it's actually on medieval castles, absolutely. When you're here in person, it hits differently. It, it feels far more imposing than probably what is being conveyed through uh, the video right now. I particularly love the gatehouse. It's just extending off a little bit from the primary tower. And uh, I'm, we're gonna get a closer look to see what type of defenses it has, but from here, we can already see a dedicated hoarding that is still attached, situated right above the primary entrance. And that is 
beautiful. It not only looks really good, it would have been there for a direct functional purpose. And as we've seen in some of the other castles we've see, explored already in Wales, on Chepstow and Kerfilly, uh, they uh, had slot matriculations. And on some other castles in Britain, they have classic matriculations right above gatehouses. So when there's going to be matriculations on British castles, they're not very common. You know, they, they're rarely decked out on all the walls and towers uh, on English or British style castles, right? But when they are present, they're usually present right above the primary entrance and if not matriculations hoardings and just that addition of the hoarding right above the gatehouse is gorgeous it's beautiful now this style of castle very likely would have had provision for hoardings to be added to uh, the towers in wartime and so you could imagine this castle with a big wooden hoarding extending out from each of the towers you can see something really interesting here on Castle Co and it's the potlug holes. See uh, on the main tower, you might be able to see, there are square holes going all the way up. Now, on uh, castles like Caerphilly, the potlug holes are really visible on the top layer, and they were left there uh, to provide uh, the ability to attach hoardings to the top battlements. The thing is though, Potlark holes like what we see here, and Kefili most likely had them, but they were filled in after construction because that's what they were actually used for. They were there for the construction scaffolding as the castle was built up. And so the castle goes up a layer, and then they put provision in the stone to be able to put in logs, pot, uh, like it's like a hole uh, for a log. And when those beams were in place, they had uh, they would attach like uh, wood walking platforms, and that would give them something to stand on to then build up the next layer. And when they got to the next layer, new holes, new logs, new platform, and they would go up. On some castles, they fill in all those potlug holes as they go up. On other castles, they're left there, and you can see the square little holes going all the way up. So in regards to the external design, this is a dream. It's so beautiful, with only a couple of little historical, uh, historically dubious kind of additions on the reconstruction. Standing at the back of the castle now, you'll see this back wall, how it kind of just curves around and just, there's some really great things to see. We, there's actually two lines of arrow loops and they're very, very thin but you can see them there, right at the edge of this kind of uh, section of uh, the base of the, the wall, how it flares out. And as it meets the wall here, we've got a line of arrow loops and then a line of water spouts. And so this is to drain the water and the spout is specifically situated further away from the wall. So the water doesn't run uh, down along the stone because that type of water drainage can actually damage stone quite considerably especially over hundreds of years and so you don't want water draining out along the, you can't avoid it with like rainfall when it's blown on the side but for like the runoff of the of the roof they want to try and channel that into the spouts and the spout will let the water fall down and not run down along the line of the wall because not only can it cause erosion it can also stain the wall with these kind of dark marks and we see more significant larger spouts on the towers as well so just a really cool architectural thing to make note of. And then of course, you see the crenellated wall, but it has a roof along the top. So do you see the crenelles, right? And the actual tooth of the crenellations? That's a crenellated wall, but it has a roof added on. That roof added onto crenellations is a later medieval style and more commonly seen on French castles. So, like with a lot of the surviving castles around, they're not kept in as pristine a state. And so they don't, they wouldn't have the hoardings attached and other things like what we saw at Caerphilly. And so if there were castles that had kind of roof coverings uh, along the rampart, uh, a lot of them would have rotted away and they wouldn't have res been restored and everything like that. So there is a chance that they, uh, had a bit more presence on British castles. So it's hard to say if this is more of a feature that the uh, people who reconstructed the castle wanted to add, or you could say, nah, it's, it's valid enough and historical enough, but still it is a later medieval thing that definitely would have appeared somewhere along in Britain at, towards the later medieval period. So this is supposed to represent a 13th century castle. Eh, it's probably a bit too early. Yet yeah, it looks gorgeous. It looks absolutely beautiful. You can't really see it from here, but there's actually a moat that goes around this front part of the castle, hence the need for the bridge and drawbridge. And it's pretty deep, but it's hard to get a perspective, an idea of just how deep it is from where we are. So let's go take a closer look. 
So Castle Core has a type of moat ringing around it. It's more like a ditch because as this, uh, you know, moat that I'm standing in rings around, the, uh, the ledge here basically tapers off to nothing on the back side. But still, for this side of the castle, having a moat like this would really nullify your ability to get a siege tower up where it needs to be if you're trying to breach the castle walls. And I hope you can see how deep the ditch is in perspective by me walking through it right now. And oh my gosh, this looks amazing from this position. But also, uh, like if you were besieging the castle, like if, if people were up there trying to shoot down at you, I can really see, you know, a type of cover. This is the whole point of machicolations. So standing right here, especially if, when you're seeing up at the battlements, that's the, you know, no one would be able to shoot at you unless they lean really out. It emphasizes in a big way how important having machicolations would be at the top of this tower. And if not machicolations, hoardings. The other thing that needs to be mentioned though from this position is even if you were to get this close to get some type of cover from the arrow fire above if there weren't hoardings attached, what could you do from here? <laughs> it's like, this isn't Age of Empires where you can just... No, uh, like castles worked for a reason and this is too tall to put a ladder against, okay? And so if we look over here, right? Like again, look at the height of where everything is and I like, I can see the arrow loops right here, okay? And I reckon people could shoot at me from even this position. If I go right here, they might not be able to hit me. But I'm probably vulnerable from the crenel and the arrow loops over on the uh, curving wall here. This curving wall is actually kind of cool because you could almost imagine it as a corner of a really large tower. Right? Imagine a tower that had the circumference of this kind of curving wall. And so it's almost achieving the same effect as if you had a tower on this back end, just one with a really wide circumference. Because uh, if you go back further, when uh, you know the old Romans loved to build in squares and stuff, this wouldn't be curved. It would be coming to an actual point here, which wouldn't give nearly as great a field of fire. Uh, especially for people who are going around the wall, but by being curved, all right, it just enables that whoever's manning the arrow loops can shoot further in the opposite direction around the corner because it's already curving in that direction. The other thing that I wanted to point out, again, like imagine trying to sail this castle, right? If you were trying to uh, um, assault it with an escalade, uh, so you'd have ladders, right? And you're on here, you place a ladder, the ladder would have to be massive to reach the, the, the crenel. And that's where you would want it. You would want the ladder to just land right underneath the crenel of the battlements. You don't want the ladder reaching higher above it because that means the defenders can grab the top rungs of the ladder and push it off. Though the angle might be too great, but if they had like a, a pole to really get the leverage off. So at best, like you would need a, <laughs> to get a ladder that big, you would always need four guys to carry it. And then imagine trying to sail it with a, oh, it'd be a nightmare. And it'll be one of the only options you had. You're not going to get a siege tower here because of the moat. And interestingly, if we actually try and go all the way around, yes, the moat is tapering down and getting lower and lower and lower. But when we get to here, well, we're actually reaching the side of the hill that the castle is resting on. And so even though the moat ends, the land a little bit further down here begins to slope down the mountainside. And so good luck getting a siege tower, uh, you know, to the castle from this vantage. This might be the only position where you could get a siege tower, but a big problem. There's no flat area to bring it here. Like Again, hillside, straight down. And so even though the moat basically ends here, it's because it's not needed. <laughs> it has a cliffside right there that effectively does the same thing. There's actually a number of beautiful little features that they still have on this castle, which would have been absolutely present on the medieval castle that stood here before the reconstruction. So see those little coverings in on the crenelles? That just gives the people who are defending the castle additional cover from counter fire from anyone attacking. You also see the spouts that are sticking out a bit further than the ones along the back wall. You can actually see 
one of the arrow loops right here. Do you see how thin that is? Uh, there's an arrow loop right there. And of course, we see all the potlug holes on the castle all around. Another beautiful little detail is the statue of the Mother Mary and the infant saviour right there with the fluid elise in the background. And man, I just love that they have a permanently fixed hoarding right there. Looks beautiful. So we're looking at the gatehouse here and I was almost expecting to find a slot murder hole in between these two archways like we saw in Kefili gatehouses. It's not a slot uh, murder hole, but just a more conventional murder hole here in front of the portcullis and another one right behind it. So I'm inside the interior courtyard of Koch Castle right now and there's something really interesting. What I'm walking past here are the arrow loops on the lower wall. Now if they were intending to uh, reconstruct this castle as just a fancy Lord's Indulgence or Manor House, why did they restore authentic battlements like this along the bottom layer here? And the reason is because it's clear that there was an intention to restore this into a more authentic medieval state. Even though there's an oddity here or two, like the top, you know, um, uh, turret up there. The fact that they kept details like this of authentic arrow loops, and look how deep this alcove is, right? You would be able to stand fully with a longbow right here, shooting down, goes to show you that there is still a heck of a lot of authenticity to the exterior design of this castle. And there are more little authentic details, like the corbels that these wooden supports are resting on for the walkway up here. Perfectly done. And this walkway kind of rings the entire inner courtyard of this castle and just looks absolutely gorgeous. Gives you a view all the way around. And they've kept it in great condition, you know, painted, lots of style. It's beautiful. One of the things I love about this castle is its more modest size. But the thing is though, it's actually not modest in regards to historical castles. This would still be considered on the larger end when you consider all castles collectively. A lot of the famous ones, like the ones we've even visited honestly, like Chepstow, Caerphilly, and the ones we're going to be visiting, like Carnarvon, represent some of the biggest castles historically, and they get a lot of attention as a result. Where castles like this, are more representative, even though this is still on the bigger size. This tower behind me right here could have been uh, like the sole keep of many historical castles, and there's still a number of examples. But because this is closer in size to the more common style of castles, I, I kind of enjoy it even more. Looking at the castle from above, we can see how simple yet elegant this layout is essentially a linked or towered castle where the primary buildings are actually attached to the outer wall and there isn't a disconnected central keep. There's one tower that stands taller than all the others which you would probably identify as the donjon or keep. Sometimes those terms can be interchangeable but because there's no real defined difference between a primary residence and a primary fortified tower there's no real reason to be pedantic about what the primary tower would be on this one so pretty simple to just call it the donjon, honestly. Modest yet still large when you regard all the sizes of castles. Simple yet elegant in design with some beautiful, beautiful embellishments and its state. It is in pristine condition and is one of the highlights of the castles that I'm visiting as I'm traveling across Britain. This castle is stunning. So I'm currently standing on the rampart of the rightmost tower if you're looking at the castle from the front. And what you see here is the main battlement here, and these ones are very, very tall, with shutters over the arrow loops. And on the inside, a thinner wall making another room and then you have the rampart space in between. It's actually a pretty cool design, but, and it is accurate. I've seen this type of design on a lot of castles, though usually later period castles, but this is to reflect about a 13th century one. And so that actually fits quite nicely. And, oh, it looks beautiful. You, you saw this tower from the outside. Well, this is what it's like on the inside. Big, you know, arrow loops with the right. Yeah, actually, you can get a full drawer on a bow. And of course, we see the shutters right here. These big wooden shutters on the inside. 
I don't know if this is how it was done with a big, this looks like cast iron as well. So if you could make this out of forged iron, then yeah, something like this could possibly work. I, I have a feeling that shutters like this are in the period, most likely just had like a wooden, um, you know, uh, lever that came out that you could just push forward and hook onto something to get the angle out. Uh, the other thing that's a bit odd is that this crenellation is actually really high. So the, the, this crenelle here is so high, like it's not even angled down. You would not be able to shoot really anyone very close to the tower at all. So that's probably quite clearly an inaccuracy in the reconstruction here because it's, un it's mostly unfunctional as a result. Uh, either you need a higher foothold or this like stand, I mean, or this needs to be lower. Do you remember that neo-gothic turret that I was able to point out from the outside of the castle and when we we're inside the courtyard? Well, that's it right here. And this actually means that there might be more validity to having that turret in its design, perhaps just not with the style of roof it had. Because inside this side kind of circular part of the tower, which forms the turret, is a main stairwell. And, and it's how we got access to the roof here. And so it wasn't just like a side little addition that they added on for aesthetics, which often neo-Gothic turrets are added onto just for look. This is serving a very important functional purpose. And with the care and attention that the um, people took in reconstructing this castle, especially with fine details like that, it really seems like that they were going out of their way to reconstruct the castle in its original design, which makes me suspect that this side kind of circular uh, attachment to the main tower here was very well likely part of the original foundation and castle and might have ended in just a crenellated turret or something more typical of the period like we see on Carnarvon. And so the presence of the turret on the side I think is actually far more valid and and plausible, and it's just really the roof which is more neo-gothic now, but so it's an important functional part of the castle. This looks to be a cast iron drain. Uh, no, not medieval as a result. But what's interesting, there would be water runoff from this roof that would fall down right here. And so what they would want then is the water would run off and what they have here, I believe, is very accurate. We have a drain. The water would run down here, come into a drain, and this more stereotypically would run into one of those spouts that we saw outside, which would let the water drain and not run down the side of the wall, and then it would just fall uh, just like that. And so this, yes. Uh, this, not so much. It's not to say that they couldn't have had a type of um, clay piping uh, or pipe work maybe even wood, uh, but this is clearly cast iron. And so uh, that's what makes me very dubious about it. So overall, the layout and design of Koch Castle, is it Koch? again, sorry for the pronunciation, is actually brilliant. It is a beautiful example of, people consider it smaller, yet this is still a bit on the large scale but more representative of what most medieval castles were in size. And it's beautiful, I love it. Yet the inside is its own beast to tackle. And from having explored the castle inside, it's actually far better than I was expecting. It's, this castle's become one of my all time favorite for a big reason, but you get to find that out in the castle where we explore the inside and there's some great things to see. So I hope to see you there and thank you for joining me in this video. So until that time, farewell.